And appreciate it. Uh, I'm Graben Gavar. I'm a principal systems engineer with High Trust. Now, High Trust is in the security software, uh, in particular for cloud and virtualization environments. So my talk today is uh, really just to kind of bring you up to speed with what's going on in, in the industry, um, some of the drivers for adoption, what, what we've seen. The, a lot, lot of the players are changing within the cloud. I'm not sure if you've noticed. Take a look at some real world use cases around security for cloud environments and virtualization environments, some of the risks, some of the challenges, and uh, talk about at a high level some of the solutions that companies like High Trust are bringing to bear to try to solve some of those challenges. And also, uh, I'll give you some additional near term cloud security solutions that'll be popping up this year. So essentially, uh, cloud, it means a lot to, to many people. And the first thing that you need to do is really define it, right? So you can run a private cloud, and a lot of people are. Uh, you could also buy a private cloud and have it in your own enterprise and have somebody run it for you. Uh, so it really is a matter of uh, getting the software stacks together, getting the, you know, obviously the hardware, building the data center, and essentially virtualizing it. And, and off you go. Uh, it's either customer operated or remotely managed, as I mentioned. And then there's this whole concept of virtual private cloud. So if you look at the NIST definition of cloud, they have public and private cloud, essentially. But a lot of what you see out there in the industries is virtually private cloud, which is essentially a, a public multi-tenant environment that's secure enough for your enterprise workloads. So that, uh, I know it's an oxymoron to some folks, but it actually can be done. I used to work at a company that did just that. And then within the virtual privacy, you've got a, either cloud managed service, hosted cloud services. So you could you can manage your own data center in somebody else's data center, right? And typical hosted solution, or they can manage it for you as well. And with all of that, you have all the nuances of the backup, the bursting, the snapshots, the DR. All those things are security potholes that you really need to be aware of, right? Not everybody handles it differently. One of the things that carriers do the first day you sign up with them to meet your SLA, they make seven or eight copies of your data right away. Where does that go, right? Do you have to worry about it long term? Well, certainly you do. Um, and then there's the public cloud, right? The wild, wild west. Amazon uh, started it. You know, there's a lot of people, uh, even VM, VMware has gotten now into the, into the uh, public cloud space. So it's uh, essentially server provider managed and, and cloud for the masses. And here's a, the devolving landscape, right? So uh, I, I hope all these companies are actually still in business. I think they are. I checked. So you have the public clouds, right? The Amazon rack spaces. You know, VMware now is v, v Cloud Air, right? So they have their own hybrid solution. Most uh, VMware is still the predominant hypervisor in the enterprise. So it makes sense for them to have a target hybrid cloud for their customers. So that's essentially what it is. You, you run out of capacity in your own internal data center, you happen to be running VMware, you can burst out the vCloud Air. You also, you also have the virtually private clouds, right? Uh, the Terramarks, Verizons, CSEs, they'll, they'll send you a, sell you a slice in a, in a multi-tenant environment and fairly securely. And with SoftLayer, the IBM company, you could actually buy bare metal servers by the hour, bare metal here, so you can build your own cloud completely separate from their management and still running the cloud on an OpEx basis. I'm actually currently doing that right now with, with them. There are other players like VirtuStream and CenturyLink, you know, they have decent clouds. I, I mentioned some of the reputable players on here. A lot of the other clouds, in my opinion, uh, have some holes in them. And then you have this whole private cloud, private cloud appliance approach that's, that's coming up. Like IBM has a private modular cloud. So they'll deliver anywhere in the world, you know, they'll back up a truck and off you go. You have a cloud in a day, essentially. And they'll manage it remotely or you can manage it. Uh, VMware has gotten into the hardware space. I don't know if you noticed the VMworld. VMware now has the Evo Rail, which is a, a low-cost appliance that comes already kitted with their software. So you can get a cloud running in, you know, in a matter of minutes. And then the hardware vendors, the HPs, the Dells, VCE, which is the combination of VMware, Cisco, and, and EMC will also build cloud appliances or cloud solutions for you. So that kind of gives you, there's a lot of choices out there, so you need to really dig in deeper to see, you know, how secure is there is a multi-tenant environment, what type of 
uh, protection for your data and, and security for your data is possible, and your mileage will vary. So why is the rush, and I, I, I guess I'm not sure if you guys see this, these economics that often, but virtualization gets you 40% total cost of ownership reduction. And going into cloud can get you upwards of another 60% more low earning cost. Right, so that's the reason people are just rushing to the cloud. Um, I go around talking to large enterprise mostly. You'll find some banks in New York City are 5% virtualized. So those are completely, they're afraid of anything virtual. And then you'll find other banks that are 99% virtualized. And then the same thing, you'll find retail that's 100%, retail that's 0%. So it's really across the board. And when you show a CIO these kind of metrics, you know, greater than 50% savings, you know, they're gonna, it's gonna pique their interest and they're gonna move in that direction. So really the message is, whether you're for it or against it, it's coming. As soon as, you know, the, the, the whole recession really accelerated the movement to cloud. I don't know if you guys noticed. But, you know, people were laying off engineers buying cloud services and it's, it hasn't stopped, it still continues. So why is it good for your business? Well, it delivers IT on demand, which is good, enables your customers, your employees, I told you about 80% more efficient in, than traditional IT. Uh, I actually worked for a company that ran SAP. Now the hardcore SAP ERP modules, we ran them better in our cloud than customers were running them on physical hardware on-prem. Completely unbelievable scenario, unbelievable story, and to the point where SAP gave the company $40 million to, you know, to continue operations, because they, they were believers too at, at the end. And it has to do with a lot of the economics and, and the operational efficiencies that could be brought to bear. It actually made the software run better. So what we need is really, we need services that you can get up and quickly, right? Enterprises want to, want to get up right away. They want to spin up, spin down, pay only for what you use. But they want all of this without compromising security, right? So they don't, they don't want to be the next company in the news. And uh, everybody's doing it. Right, healthcare, even though they have all these privacy uh, regulations, they're seriously into the cloud. And they, they're looking for solutions that an, can enable more cloud adoption. Finance industry, um, they are, you know, I mentioned a few of them. We, we have relationships with some of the largest uh, check clearing companies in the world, uh, largest banks in the world. And um, they all have, they're all into cloud, they all have a need for security. So uh, this is a little data of its slide, but essentially virtualization has grown up, if you will. Now full data centers are virtualized. You can get a data center delivered on a truck, like I mentioned. You can make it your internal, external cloud. And they're really adapting the most intelligent pieces of the infrastructure that are being de developed. And it's to save money. Everybody's moving it to save money. Uh, what applications are being put on? All the the biggest applications, the most stringent requirements, they can now all run safely in the cloud. SAP, Oracle, I've implemented all of these so I know it's possible. Um, so it's, if, it, if your customers haven't started moving in that direction, they are and they're gonna need your help in really making their workloads secure. So what are the biggest challenges when you move into the public cloud? Surprise, surprise, security is the largest, right? And everybody knows that. But there's migration challenges Compliance is a big one. If you talk to any healthcare company, they're not gonna to move to anywhere with the cloud word if you don't really handle their compliant uh, workloads like HIPAA, things like that. Um, disaster recovery, it, it could be a pain, right? You could be in the wrong cloud. If you're not replicating to another data center, you know, how are, how are you gonna recover? Recovering, disaster recovery in a cloud is complicated, right? You gotta move, you gotta shunt your VLANs or move your IP uh, address you got to instantiate on the fly, you got to bring all your applications up. So what's really your recovery time objective, right? That's what you really got to ask. If you're, if you're aiming for zero to, uh, recovery time objective, then you really need a, an application that's multi-site aware and can really survive that. Because if not, it's, it's going to be hours of outages to get for a carrier to bring your application back up. So people want to move into public and hybrid, but they want adequate security and availability and compliance, right? So here's what the challenges are in the enterprise. So these are insider threats. 
and the most costly type of attack and the hardest to solve. So how much does it cost for an attack? So here, malicious insiders, it's uh, roughly $154,000 to recover from malicious insider. Uh, that's what the data from uh, Ponymon is showing us. And average days to resolve from an attack, again, malicious insiders can cause a lot of, a, a lot of havoc. So something we believe in high trust, and I think the industry, certainly the FBI has, has started to tell people, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when somebody's going to penetrate your perimeter and get inside. All right? So we believe that's an area worth focusing on. So some real world, case, uh, real world cases, Shinogi Pharmaceutical, uh, several uh, virtual administrators, well, one was let go, he happened to be a friend of one of the guys that wasn't let go, and he was upset about it. And this happened uh, a few years back, big, big uh, Japanese pharmaceutical company. Well, eventually, this disgruntled employee also was let go. I guess they were having some downsizing. So he went to the local McDonald's, he, he actually tried and he had left back doors that he could try to penetrate the, the network, and he was unsuccessful from many other areas, so he had to get close enough to, to their operations and, and then ended up using a McDonald's Wi-Fi. What, he, what did he do? He deleted 88 virtual servers in, in a minute, and he took down everything, took down their email, took down all their operations, and uh, they couldn't even inform their customers that they'd been hacked. They didn't have an email server. So it could be pretty drastic when somebody you know, steals you, all, all your servers. And the virtualization risk, since everything's concentrated into a few, a few boxes, really allows that to happen. Uh, the FBI caught him. Why? Because he was silly enough to use his credit card to buy something at McDonald's that day. And they tracked him down to that day it happened. He was a former employee bank. So he's in jail right now. And then also insiders, I don't know if you heard about this one, the National Ocean uh, Oceanographic uh, Agency essentially had, a, had a, an employee that was, for some reason, was taking home data. And they were taking home data about sensitive U.S. dams. And the data happened to be about how many people lived around those dams and would be impacted if those dams were breached. Who knows what they were planning to do with that information. But that individual was caught, and that just happened in October. So really, the, the lesson is that Exploitation of business networks by disgruntled employer, malicious insiders, is the number one cause of certainly expenditures, right? The second cause of, of outages or, or, or disruption of service is misconfiguration of virtual servers. We had a bank in, uh, in New York who uh, mis had a script run wild. And in a minute or two, 30,000 virtual machines were powered off, production machines. Just because of simple script was misconfigured, a change to it. Uh, if you recall Target, right, we, everybody's been talking about Target credentials compromise. Once the, co the contractor credentials were used inside the network, essentially being on the network. eBay as well, employee credentials were stolen. So all these things are pointing to people will get fished, they will be hacked, and you will get behind the network. So what we like to tell people is really you should always just make the assumption that's going to happen and start putting controls and, and protection around that. Uh, this was, uh, I guess this was a, a, a quote saying that up until J.P. Morgan was hacked, people thought that only small companies that didn't spend on, on security budgets were, were getting hacked. Well, J.P. Morgan spending, I don't know how much, they, it was in the news. They're, they're, to spend over millions and millions annually on security. And companies like that still get hacked. So really what, what we need to do is uh, increase the awareness that the consolidation of virtualization has really increased the risk. And it's created challenges for security folks like yourselves and myself to, to really protect networks. Accidental misconfiguration happens all the time. Um, credit card processing firm. Right, you have it in your wallet right now, probably several versions of it. They were down four minutes, $10 million lost. Right? Uh, it, was an, it was a junior admin. They thought they were to take certain systems down, and, but they took the wrong VMs. And you know, fortunately, the, the, the person uh, recognized it in time, but in four minutes' time, they had lost tens of millions of dollars. Some of the, some of the mitigation that exists out there, uh, 
strong role-based access controls or something that, that, that we like to promote, things like two-man rule, things that could be disruptive to your operation, critical VMs, things that are in production. There shouldn't be a reason why one person should have the authority to, to cross havoc, either maliciously or accidentally. So having somebody else approve uh, significant actions is important. Some of the other risks that we see, obviously availability and performance. If your application is not running, even if it hasn't been hacked, you're losing money and it's, you know, essentially it's, it's, you're, you're falling down on your SLA. It's, it's essentially not delivering its value. Compliance is a big one. Uh, moving, if you talk to a bank about moving, in, moving their financial information in, into the cloud, into a public cloud, most of them will say no. Healthcare, for financial reasons, is starting to put their foot in that, in that pond. And they need tools to secure that personally identifiable information. Because they, more than anything, anybody else, they get uh, penalized financially very strongly for, for every breakage or every uh, break in. Where the financial industry, it costs them a lot of money, but it's mostly their own money. They don't really get financially penalized that much by the government. So here's the traditional data centers were pretty secure. You had a bunch of boxes, each of them had a different element system, and you had different people assigned to manage them. So it was really secure. You had to have collusion to really break into and steal the whole data center, right? Today, that's all consolidated into one system or a group of systems, right? So the significant risk has been collapsed. It's one, one password, one credential to get you essentially in the core of your network. And once you're in the core, unless you protect it, you have access to all of it. In the public cloud, you need to be aware of data theft, or secure decommissioning. All right, so Amazon made 30 copies of my VMs for SLA purposes because I use them all over the world. When you, when you get tired of them and you want to move to somewhere else, how, are you, how, how can you guarantee yourself that that data has been destroyed? Right? That's a big problem, and, that's, and that keeps big institutions from moving to the cloud because they, they worry about that, right? So historically, we focused on the OS, the data files, and the applications. We had users, we had admins, every, the world was happy. All we had to do was put a perimeter around these things, right? Then lo and behold, we got virtualization. We created this whole another group of people, virtual admins, right? A lot of, a lot of corporate America, and certainly in, in, in our government, they hadn't thought about the power that these people had been given, right? These people could actually copy not only the OS, not only the applications and the data. So imagine if Snowden had been a virtual admin. He not only had the data which he stole, but he would have had the methods, the applications and you know, the thinking behind what we do with the data. Right? So a virtual admin exposure or, or, or um, credentials being compromised exposes you to a lot more. How easy is it to steal a whole data center? Essentially, you export the OVF, which is a, a virtualization file. You name it stolen VM, map it to a USB drive, and you export it, click OK. There you go. All your data is in somebody's pocket. So it's very easy for this to happen. And then, given the very nature of the bank's virtualizations and cloud platforms, they're very highly susceptible to this type of attack. They, um, Heretofore, they've only protected the perimeter. And, and we're here to really tell people that you really need to already assume you've been hacked or, or penetrated, and you really need to start putting controls. So you minimize your losses, right? So, all right, so one, one virtual admin's uh, credentials get stolen. Well, good thing you have separation of duties or swim lanes within your virtual infrastructure, right? If you don't have those, then yes, they can reach into any area within the corporate environment. Here's some of the challenges. So data security. So how do I maintain confidentiality of sensitive data? No matter where it is, right? No matter where Amazon put that, right? A snapshot over there, a template over there, who knows where it went? So that's a requirement. You want to know where your data is. But the challenge is that you have little control over that data in the public cloud. You can't tell them steward here or steward there or show me how you actually deleted it. Um, that's not easily done. Right? Most solutions, for instance, a lot of people use storage arrays as their encryption methodology. Well, guess what? When you remove it from the storage array, it's in the clear. 
Somebody could put it on a USB stick, and that data is in the clear. So you really want to make sure you, you protect data at rest, and even when it's copied, right? Multi-tenant. Uh, not only people worried about noisy neighbors, but you also want to make sure that your neighbor is not leaking into your, your data and stealing it. Uh, so it's difficult to meet some of the requirements of multi-tenancy. Uh, you have to support it. There, there are good hardware architectures and there are bad hardware architectures. And all cloud providers differ. So you really need to look at how they segment the, the context of each customer, right? Some, some cloud providers for customer sensitive data, they isolate the whole system from the internet. Not accessible. You need an MPLS, you need the VPN in, and, and that's the only way you can get access to your data. And if you, oh, if you need to actually jump in, you, you need to put a jump box behind the firewall. So some, some carriers actually look after your, your, your data and, and protect it. Others don't. Compliance is a big one. We've, we're seeing a lot of this. I'm not sure how, let's see a show of hands. PCI 3.0. PCI, let me show of hands as to who's familiar with PCI 3.0. Okay, so starting January 2015, the virtual infrastructure is in scope for PCI 3.0, DSS. Okay, prior to this, virtualization wasn't even in, in the definition, right? So starting this year, to be compliant with PCI, if you're using virtual infrastructure, they must conform and must be audited and, and pass the, the QSA's assessment, right? So, I mean, what are people going to do? A lot of people are, are actually bringing their systems compliant. A lot of people are taking their... Their, their PCI infrastructure and put it back into the physical world to meet the compliance. So it, it differs. Um, healthcare data. The healthcare, you know, they, to have anything outside the, the walls, uh, the safest way to do it is through, through encryption of, of personal identifiable information. And not only is that a good thing, if they do get breached, it gives you safe harbor. So essentially, because you had it encrypted, you were doing your best to protect it so you don't incur the penalties from the government. So the challenge is supporting hybrid and public cloud. Essentially, you, you want to make sure you don't lose the agility and the efficiency. That's why you went into the cloud to begin with. Right? So you, you want to increase your IT on demand for the business, responsiveness. You want to lower costs. But you don't want to be the guy that gets fired because there was, you were responsible for the data leakage. So security and compliance remains a big problem. right? Um, Although you can no longer, as an IT guy, say, no, we're not moving to the cloud, right? Because that, that response will also get you fired. Because the day and age where people are buying their own hardware and paying, you know, $150,000 engineers, multiple of them, to, to manage the OS, to manage the infrastructure, those days are long gone. So there's a goal is to leverage public cloud by creating less friction and less concern about moving there, both public and hybrid. So the challenge is, how do you give a virtual administrator essentially? Hello, I'm Geek again. Once again, another Avermedia freeze. I don't know what's up with these folks. I'm pretty sure it's the Avermedia and not uh, OBS. Eventually, the actual talks will start back up again, so I'm going to pontificate in the meantime. I'm pretty sure it's not OBS because the Elgato just keeps on trucking. But it's USB 2, it's slightly delayed. Now, while it's older and not quite as good in theory, technically, as the Media, the Elgato just keeps trucking. That's nice. The Media, on the other hand, freezes a whole lot. And it kind of makes me wish that more things had come out last year. So, that I bought the StarTech um, HDMI and VGA capture device instead. There's always something better coming along. Anyway, that's just me ranting about video capture gear. Here shortly, the talk will start back up again, but eh, give it about a minute and a half and then you should see the talk again. Or at least hear the audio again. Sorry for the delay.
So, so I mentioned earlier in the earlier session we had Target, Home Depot, J.P. Morgan Chase. They were all PCI compliant. All of them were PCI compliant. They had their assessor's credentials. But were they compliant the day they got hacked? No. So the problem with PCI compliance is that you need to maintain it. It needs to be autonomous. It needs to be automated, constantly running. Because human nature being what it is, somebody will always leave an attack surface open if you, if you allow that to happen. So you want automated closing of any attack surface that gets opened by an individual. You know, the customer wants you to procure, they want to procure solutions that enable policy-driven security, right? Essentially set it once, they don't have to worry that whether it's running or not. Right? And that gives them peace of mind. It keeps the systems up and running. You don't put too many hurdles within your infrastructure. And it also keeps you compliant. So that's what they're looking for. So a couple of areas of focus. Administrator controls for your virtualization environment and your software-defined networks. So now, you know, your software-defined network essentially creates data centers on the fly all over the world. So you need controls over that. You know, who knows, you know, who the admin is for your cloud service provider in, you know, Malaysia, right? Is that person reputable or not? So really, you should have solutions where the, the cloud storage admin and the cloud virtualization admin, people that need to do their jobs for, you, for your software and your, and your enterprise to be up and running, but they don't need to see your data. They don't need to copy your data. So you need solutions that prevent them, even if they wanted to, looking at the data. Some of the methods are encryption, right? You can, you can encrypt drives and partitions within virtual machines. You can make them very portable, so you can move from one carrier to the other carrier, so, so if you so desire. And you don't have to worry about the legacy of decommissioning all those snapshots, all those clones, all those templates, right? Because they stay encrypted with solutions that, that allow that. Right? So you can cleanly separate yourself from a cloud service provider and not worry about the legacy data living behind because every one of those is going to be essentially obsolete. You're going to take the key with you. And that's really one of the, one of the things that you need to put administrators controlled in the virtual environment and then you also need to protect your data as it moves around both your internal and your external environment. The best way to do that is to have a key management, key control solution that you keep within your own enterprise. Don't let the carrier manage your encryption. Because guess what? As soon as uh, the storage array where they're keeping your data and a bunch of other data, as soon as any customer on that storage array gets subpoenaed and they need to turn over, the, the carrier needs to turn over that data because it's been subpoenaed, everybody who has data on that storage array gets turned over. And the encryption key for the whole shebang is essentially turned over. So people don't want that. So keep key management, keep control within your enterprise. Send your encrypted machines out to the cloud, but you keep the control. Your, the, the admins, nor the storage, nor virtualization, nobody in the, in the cloud service provider can see it that way. You can get portable encryption today. This is essentially shown what I was showing. In your own private cloud, their own data center, you keep the keys and then send out those virtual machines to the public cloud. Uh, there's a couple of different use cases. For instance, uh, some people encrypt everything. Eliminates data classification, right? You don't have high priority, low priority data. It's easier today. The performance hit is gone, right? 2% hit on decryption. So it's negligible, right? As long as you're using the advanced, you know, uh, the AES NI, new instruction set from Intel and AMD processors, right? Because they do the decryption and encryption within the hardware. And guess what? That's also a, a much secure way of doing it as well, because the, the, the encryption and decryption key is not hitting the cache. It stays within the chip. So that's a, a secure way of doing it. Uh, so uh, essentially, you want to create apps that are cloud aware, and you can essentially move them easily, scale them up, scale them down, and you need secure backup. So whatever your backup solution is from your carrier, you know, make sure you understand it. Make sure you understand who has access to it. Is it encrypted on the way in? Is it encrypted on the way out? Is it encrypted at rest? Ask all those hard questions. So essentially, we need strong encryption at data at rest, virtualization and cloud protection, and then you need strong compensating controls, right? You need, you need automated controls 
that are continuously monitoring, continually assessing, and if you wish, continuously automatic remediation of surface attacks or, or attack surfaces that have been exposed. Right? Those are the type of controls you want as a security person, because you could be self-assured that when you go home for the weekend, you're not, your weekend's not going to be interrupted with some, with some type of outage or some type of hack, as long as you have a continuous monitoring, continuous assessing solution and, and automated remediation as well. And not only that, but it also gives you safe harbor from, from the government. So uh, talked a little bit about the cloud adoption and you know, obviously people want operational simplicity, so whatever solution you choose better be easy to use. If not, your folks aren't going to use it. You want it to be API driven if possible. One of the things that is available out there in the industry is, is uh, dynamic rekeying. So in the financial industry, some are as strict as monthly, others are annual, where you have to deploy a new encryption key to all your virtual machines. And in yesterday's technology, you had to bring every one of those servers down to do that. For a financial firm, that's millions lost by the productivity and revenue. So you want solutions that allow you to dynamically rekey everything while it's in service, right? That's, that's the way it should be. You want, you want solutions that could work with any operating system, application transparency, we like to say, across any cloud infrastructure, private, hybrid, public, you name it. You know, third party, contractors, wh wherever they may be using uh, your data, you, you want a, a solution that extends there. And we talked about keeping the keys secure, right? Creating uh, high available key servers, right? So they're, they're not prone to one, one or, or pair. You know, you, you want to distribute the load and distribute the survivability of your encryption solution. So here are some con concrete steps that you can take for secure adoption, right? So wherever possible, you need to do these things on the left. Administrative controls, strong access control, secondary approval. A lot of people haven't thought about that. There are solutions out there to mandate the second set of eyes needs to approve those disruptive things. Trusted execution. Uh, Intel makes a technology called TXT, Trusted Execution Technology. It's, it's, on, the, it's on the bare motherboard. And what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a module called the TPM, Trusted Platform Module. And it takes, every time it's powered on, the server's powered on, it takes a hash value of the boot code, the BIOS code, the, the hypervisor drivers, and the hypervisor itself and, and creates a known good value for that image, right? That known good server. And what they do then is they, you know, and which is standard good operational practices that you want to kind of standardize on the low number of platforms, right? You don't want to have every, every one of your servers be different, right? So you want to have standard solutions, standard deployments. Well, knowing, the trust, knowing that those servers are trusted allows you to put critical workloads on those servers, right? And, and this is now even possible for the carriers that are giving you bare metal to run in their clouds. So if that carrier happens to be, you know, somewhere in the southeast in Asia, you can actually attest that server. Because, you know, you know what the NSA did to the, to, to the keyboards and, and, and the laptops in Russia, right? They, they put these chips embedded in the boards that weren't, didn't talk to anything else except they emitted the keyboard logs to, you know, to I think a two block or two mile radius and the NSA was, anything that was sold in, in, in Russia, they were actually listening in, right? So these are the type of things that you want to prevent. You want to prevent a rootkit from being sold to your carrier in a remote area, right? And you can actually attest to that based on internal sort of chip. And if it doesn't, if it's untrusted, you can decide. You either put your web traffic out there or something you want or, or you shut it down. And obviously configuration management and patchment and patching are important, as you guys know. So encrypt data wherever it's stored, and then keep, keep, uh, be aware of how backups are done, how replication's done, and who has access to your data. Here's a blurb on the TXT. I just covered it, but it's pretty slick technology. Uh, not only does it do trusted execution, but there's also geotags available within, within the the, what they call them PCR values, so the stored values. And uh, if somebody tries to tamper with the, with the TPM module by the, taking it apart or reprogramming it, it essentially becomes unusable. So it's actually pretty good for that. But you can program geodata 
into your, into your motherboard. And so you'll know that physically, for instance, there's a lot of um, country regulation out there. For instance, the Swiss data, the Swiss government, you, any, any, any data pertaining to a Swiss citizen can't leave Switzerland, right? So you're a cloud service provider or you're a large enterprise, that's hard to manage. Solutions like this allow you to geotag servers and then put policy in place to make sure those virtual machines don't break the law, right? So that's uh, pretty useful, useful uh, security. And here's some, some, of the, some of the gaps and how the things, uh, the various ways to be solved. So uh, unauthorized access, you know, as I mentioned, you should have strong authentication, strong passwords, and have two-factor auth authentication for your admins. Um, segmentation and multi-tenancy is very important. You know, people, somebody from HR shouldn't be browsing the financial folders, right, of the data. Forensic logs, uh, can't say enough about that, right? When you look at the log, you want to know, you want an audit trail, you want to know what happened. You don't want to have to, to guess, and, for, and first of all, you won't pass audit, you won't pass compliance without it. Uh, NIST has done a better job now of really highlighting the, the exposure to virtual infrastructure. Take a look at some of those things, and, and the, the rating agencies, HIPAA and PCI, they're, they're following the leads, so take a look at those. Um, another near future technology that's going to be in play within this, this concept that we've been discussing is the concept of boundary control. So I talked about keeping virtual machines from leaving geographies. Well, guess what? Imagine if you could somehow marry that with encryption and decryption. So not only are you keeping virtual machines where they need to be, you could also, with technology that's going to be released you know, by, by the mid-year, mid you can actually decide that data that gets encrypted can only be decrypted in, not only in the geography that you want it to, but down to the data center, the pod, the physical server where you want it to be decrypted. So long are going to be the days when somebody actually steals everything. They get inside your network. They took you know, the highest level virtual admin's credentials. They found the encryption key or, or the decryption key and they took your data and took off to a foreign land with it. Technology is going to be in place that is going to check, oh, is this server in Columbus, Ohio? Guess what? They had that person logged in, authenticated, authorized, everything has the key, but it won't decrypt the data because of the checks that can be put into the physical hardware to prevent it. So those are the kind of solutions that, and I know you guys are typically trying to break into the networks, but that's what's coming at you, right? The enterprise has gotten a little bit smarter about and certainly uh, critical workloads are being protected to the maximum now. Um, essentially says the same thing. Server integrity, virtual placement integrity, and then data decryption by location. Um, that's what I had uh, to discuss. This just goes through the various uh, forms of, of the same thing. Any questions on that? I don't want to keep you guys that long. 15 minutes for, for questions. Any questions on what I said? Curiosities? Want to talk about some of the hacks, some of the things that, that have occurred, how they occurred? Has anybody ever uh, successfully uh, compromised a virtual system? Be curious. Or just, or just servers. Because uh, compromising virtual admins, they think that's what happened to Sony. It's just the volume of data stolen. It had to be somebody with virtual admin privileges, right? A virtual admin can console into any, any, and all machines. So it's a, it's a good place to be. All right, I guess uh, I'm standing between you guys and your beer, so let's not, let's not do that any longer. I appreciate your time hanging out to the very end. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening. Yeah.